true murder is a rare insight into a killer's tortured mind. The most shocking killers in true crime history. Victims were, were brutalized, shot, stabbed. And the authors that have written about them. Easy, Bundy, Dahmer. I would also play with yes. Thank you to play with Sam. The Night Stalker. BTK. Every week, another fascinating author talking about the most shocking and infamous killers in true crime history. True Murder, with your host, journalist and author, Dan Zupanski. Good evening. A Civil War veteran who perpetrated one of the most ghastly mass slaughters in the annals of U.S. crime a 19th century female serial killer whose victims included three husbands and six of her own children, a gilded age bluebeard who did away with as many as 50 wives throughout the country, a decorated World War I hero who orchestrated a murder that stunned Jazz Age America, while other infamous homicides from the same eras, the Lizzie Borden slayings, for example, or the thrill killing committed by Leopold and Loeb have entered into our cultural mythology these four equally sensational crimes have largely faded from public memory. A quartet of gripping historical true crime narratives, Butcher's work restores these once notorious cases to vivid, dramatic life. The book that we're featuring this evening is Butcher's work, True Crime Tales of American Murder and Madness, with my special guest, retired professor and author, Harold Schechter. Welcome back to the program, and thank you very much for this interview. Harold Schechter. Well, thank you for inviting me. Always uh, happy to be here. It's always a pleasure to get to talk to you. And congratulations on this recent book, Butcher's Work. Thank you. First off, tell us about the four tales that are included. What are the names of the four parts, if you don't mind? Well, I'll tell you the subjects. First one is the a case of Anton Propes. Actually, that part is called Butcher's Work, which is the title of the whole book. You know, as you said in the introduction, I mean, Probst committed arguably the most horrific mass murder of the American 19th century. Yes. A second part called The Poison Fiend is about a female serial killer named Lydia Sherman, who, as you also indicated, poisoned three husbands and six of her own children. The third part, which I call Lady Killer, is about this infamous Bluebeard killer of the late 19th century named, well, he had went by various names, but the one that's kind of gone down in the history books is Johann Hock. And the last case, which I call the Ragged Stranger, for reasons I will go on to explain, is about um, a World War I hero named Karl Wanderer, who, as you also indicated, orchestrated the murder of his wife, and that became this very, very sensational case in Chicago in the early 1920s. Let's get to you right in the forward, which is very, very interesting and sets the, re the reader to understand why you pick these four stories in particular. In December 1927, you write, a person named William Edward Hickman, a 19-year-old, hatched a kidnapping scheme to come up with tuition for his dream, which was seminary school. Yeah. And he went and he presented himself at the Mount Vernon Junior High School in Los Angeles. Tell us what he said to the secretary, what he did, what was what was he there for? He was there in order to abduct the daughter of a bank president, a president of a bank he once worked at. And her name was Marion Parker. And he managed to let the school administrators, he was posing as someone who was going to take her, he said her father was in a car accident. Anyway, they let her go with him. He kept her captive and uh, sent ransom notes to her father. And while he had her in captivity, he, he treated her very well, you know, comparatively speaking. You know, he would, when she got bored, he would take her out to drives. He would buy her ice cream. Then when the father finally agreed to meet his ransom demands, they arranged for a place to meet. Hickman, who signed a lot of his letters, the Fox, he liked to call himself the Fox. Mm. The arrangement was that they were going to both drive up separately in cars. Father would hand over the money. Hickman would then let the little girl out of the car and drive away. So the father showed up, handed Hickman the bag of money. The father could see in the back of the car or a passenger seat, I think, actually, you know, it looked, you know, his daughter, her eyes were open. Mm. But as soon as he handed the money to Hickman, Hickman tossed the little girl 
out of the car. And it turned out that Marion, he had killed Marion, disemboweled her, cut off her limbs, and sewn her eyes open to make it look as if she were alive. Yeah. You know, this incredibly unspeakable crime. It's oh. not even possible to imagine how her father would have reacted. Mm -hmm. Yes. Anyway, when Hickman was caught, he sort of boasted that he was going to be remembered even more than Leopold and Loeb. And in many ways, his crime was much more horrific than Leopold and Loeb's. I mean, Leopold and Loeb, you know, it was an awful crime. Yes. They also abducted a young boy and murdered him. But again, I mean, the grotesque nature of what Hickman did really unparalleled in the annals of American crime. So it was not an unreasonable expectation that he would be remembered the way Leopold and Loeb were. But in fact, he, he has been totally relegated to obscurity, whereas Leopold and Loeb have become part of cultural mythology. Movies have been made about them, Alfred Hitchcock's Rope and a movie called Compulsion, which was based on a best-selling book by Meyer Levin. There have been a number of movies made about Leopold and Loeb. You know, their crime is considered to be one of the great crimes of the 20th century. Absolutely. So what this illustrates to me, something I've been interested in for a very long time, which is why among really, I have to say, the countless numbers of horrific crimes that occur, crimes that very sensational in their own time and place that garner a lot of media attention, why they fade into obscurity, and why this infinitesimal number of other crimes, many of which are less horrific than these other crimes, become, as they say, these permanent parts of our criminal mythology. My previous book, Maniac, which was about a guy named Andrew Kehoe, who in 1927 blew up the uh, new public school in this small town of Bath, Michigan, killing, I think, 38 children and a number of the teachers. You know, this the most horrific school massacre in our history. That's been totally forgotten. Even people who live in Michigan, many of them have never heard of it. So, so that was, you know, my motive for resurrecting these other crimes. You know, all four crimes that I cover in the book, Butcher's work, were great media sensations. You know, some were covered by the international press. And yet, you know, after a very short while, they were relegated to total obscurity. And, you know, they're all very compelling stories. So, yeah, I decided to write a, a book about them. You write about why this might occur. And, and did some crimes symbolize a what you call a shadow of a given moment? Yeah. Uh, can you explain? Well, I mean, I think the crimes that do, you know, grip uh, the national psyche, let's say, there are ones that have some symbolic meaning for the time and that reflect, you know, these free floating fears and anxieties of the moment. For instance, in the case I just mentioned, the Andrew Kehoe case, which happened in 1927, you know, school massacres and suicide bombings, because that also featured in the case, you know, these weren't the kinds of crimes that Americans of the time were particularly concerned about. You know, it just seemed so weird and anomalous that it didn't really strike a deep chord with the public. There was a recognition that it was a horrendous crime. I mean, it was covered in the front page of the New York Times, you know, but, but again, it didn't somehow embody the deepest fears and anxieties of that cultural moment. Whereas Leopold and Loeb, for example, they, to my mind, what, what made them such powerful symbols is that they seem to personify this great anxiety that was rife in the culture at that time. You know, this is the jazz age, uh, you know, when this whole, you know, this great social revolution was going on and there was this widespread among middle America, well, among a lot of adults about what they call the flaming youth, you know, the out of control young people right. who are living these degenerate lives. And Leopold and Loeb seemed to be the nightmarish realization of that anxiety. You know, the same way that Charles Manson, the 60s, seemed like every parent's worst nightmare of sex and right. drug crazed hippies come to life. So I think it has a lot to do with, that's what I meant by the shadow side of the culture, you know, these dark underlying fears. And then suddenly some crime is committed that seems to be the confirmation you know, of all these nightmares, yes, that becomes a very significant part of the history of the moment. Let's talk about Anton Probst. And in 1863, he arrives in the port of New York, along with many other people. And right at this receiving center, uh, there's some opportunity right away. As soon as he 
gets into the country. Yeah. Tell us what happens as soon as he does, Anton Probe, get into the country and what does he do? Well, Probe's derived, you know, thought height of the Civil War. And uh, when immigrants would arrive in New York City, there were all these recruiting stations that were set up right at the waterfront. And as soon as these young men would get off the boat, they would be approached by recruiting agents who would offer them a bounty, a few hundred dollars, as I remember, you know, to sign up for some regiment. So that's what happened with Probst. He immediately you know, became a soldier in the Union Army during the Civil War. But he also became what was called a, a bounty jumper. There were these young men who would sign up for one regiment, collect this bounty, and then desert, and then go and sign up with another regiment, collect the bounty, desert, et cetera, et cetera. Some of them, you know, managed to make a lot of money doing that. Uh, so, you know, that seems to be the case with probes to we don't know a whole lot about his background in Germany, but certainly from all the evidence of his life in America, he was uh, he just all he cared about was satisfying his own appetites, mostly for liquor and prostitutes. You talk about after the war ended in 1865 and, it, and he had shot his right thumb off to avoid service. So that's sort of talked about his character. Yeah. But in 1865, he was tramping around, as you write, and he ended up at the farmstead of a person named Christopher Deering and his family. Yes. So he asked them if they're looking for any workers, and he was hired on for $15 a month at that time. Tell us how long he lasted. You say three weeks he lasted. What was the reason for that, and what did he do afterwards? Well, he apparently, Christopher Deering himself, you know, he was a very tolerant, humane individual who took pity on Propes. But Propes was a whiner and a grumbler and not really much given to hard work. And the story Probst told was he left because Deering had asked him to, uh, he was hired as a farmhand, do some work in the rain. And there's also some indication that Deering's wife, you know, that Probst kind of creeped out Deering's wife and she was just kind of uncomfortable having him around. Obviously, her instincts turned out to be correct, although too late. So, yeah, so he, he was let go. And then, you know, then he bummed around for a while. But again, hard to entirely trace his movements, you know. But again, Probst was the kind of person who would work at a job, blow all his money, gambling and drinking and whoring, and then go look somewhere else for another job. Anyway, at some point, he ended up back at the Deering Farm. And Deering out of what turned out to be a very misguided charity, rehired him, though at a slightly lower salary. You write that I'll, he hired him again for this $10 a month rather than the $15. But the one thing that Anton Probst had noticed the first time he was there for the first three weeks of employment, he had noticed something about this Christopher Deering that he kept in his mind and especially factored in his decision to come back the second time, as you write. Well, Deering had a partner who staked him in this cattle business. And, you know, there were times when Deering had a significant amount of money around him in order to, you know, purchase stock and so on, livestock. And uh, yeah, Probst apparently, Probst was under the impression, uh, again, incorrect, that Deering always had a lot of money in his house. Yeah. Now, on April 7th, you write that Christopher Deering went for his weekly three-mile trip to town. But on this particular date, he was also to pick up a relative at, again, to, that was arriving by boat, and Elizabeth Dolan. And Probes was working with another hand there, ranch hand, Cornelius Carey, or another farm hand, Cornelius Carey. Yeah. There was the four kids, the two employees, and Christopher Deering and his wife. Well, anyway, the wife was left back at the, the farm. When he picked up his relative at the boat and then they returned to the farm, what did they realize? So, as you say, Deering went off on this weekly errand into Philadelphia. They were living in a kind of remote area called the Neck. And he was going to have some business with his partner and then pick up this relative of his who was coming for a visit when, and again, he left behind his wife, I guess, four children, yes. including an infant in her crib. One of the children was off visiting his grandfather and during this young ranch hand who knew probes very well. In fact, in a way that was not uncommon at the time, they, they shared a bed in the Deering house. Anyway, the way I write the book, 
I then cut to the discovery uh, shortly thereafter. I don't know if it was the next day or two days later. Some neighbors became a little suspicious because, you know, they, they hadn't seen any members of the family for a while, went over to the Deering farm, and they discovered Christopher Deering, his relative, his wife, and the four children, including the infant, all slaughtered. They'd all been slaughtered with an axe. Except for the infant, I think the infant had her head bashed in, although maybe that was also with the axe. But anyway, you know, this pile of of mangled, uh, slaughtered bodies yes. that had been put in the hay in the barn. Cornelius, the young Cornelius was missing. Uh, and it became, you know, and the only one who was not around was Anton Probst. Cornelius would subsequently be, Cornelius's body, he had also been axe murdered, was subsequently found in a haystack. Uh, some distance from the house. So again, this is this horrific mass murder, the complete extermination of this entire family, except for the one kid who was lucky enough to be away visiting his grandfather. Plus this adolescent, I think Cornelius was still in his teens, as I remember, or in any case, you know, very, very young, maybe his early 20s. So this horrific mass slaughter and, uh, you know, and Probst, and Probst was gone. And of course, immediately led to the search for probes. So he had, again, this is a number of days later, he had enough of a head start. The police and the citizens of Philadelphia, you know, figured he'd really put a lot of distance between himself and this horrific crime. Right. He even returned to Germany. You know, but probes being <laughs> this dull minded individual, again, who was unable, you know, to think beyond his next drink and his next night with a prostitute had just gone back to Philadelphia and uh, was living in a boarding house and lived in a tavern for a while. And he was recognized and arrested in short order. You write one of the more fascinating parts or aspects of this story is that there was an autopsy set up to be conducted and there was a mob of people really wanting to see the victims and they gather outside this building. So very, very strange. You know, not really strange. For better or worse, that's a very, very common occurrence when there are sensational crimes. You know, one of the cases I wrote about before, I think you and I have spoken about it, was this uh, female serial murderer in Indiana named Belle Gunnis, yes. who operated what came to be called this murder farm. She would lure, she was a uh, Norwegian and she would, after, you know, killing a number of husbands for their, the insurance money, she was living alone on this farm. And she'd place classified advertisements in these Scandinavian language newspapers and lure uh, these men, lonely men, bachelors to her farm with the promise uh, of marrying them and having them become part owners of the farm. And then she would murder them and rob them and cut up their bodies and bury them in her in her yard. And when her crimes were discovered and they dug up all these dismembered body parts, they stuck for a while, you know, they stuck the body parts in an outbuilding for a while. And the Sunday, the weekend after these cars were discovered, thousands of people showed up at her farm. There are actually postcards you can buy on eBay showing these long lines of people, men, women, children, standing outside this outbuilding, you know, waiting to file in and get a look yes. at these horrible remains. It looks like they're online for a Disneyland ride or something. Wow. I mean, there are a lot, a lot of examples of that. You know, people are just drawn by this very morbid curiosity to these scenes, and they often want to see, you know, back, I'm sure you know, back in the Old West when they would kill an outlaw, this was in the Clint Eastwood movie Unforgiven. You know, they would put the outlaw's corpse on display you know, for people to, to look at and so on. So, yeah, so, so that was the, the kind of carnivalesque atmosphere where you had all these people flocking to the crime scene and, and also to come away with these ghoulish souvenirs. You know, people would yeah. come away with like blood cake pieces of the hay. There have been crimes, you know, where these uh, morbid sightseers taken apart a house where a crime occurred, you know, so they could have a little yeah. souvenir. So. Yes. Well, you write about him finally being arrested with some keen police work in terms of spotting a suspicious character yeah. outside while they were talking. And so they finally have him. And of course, 
he says that he killed the farmhand, but he didn't kill the rest of them. And they said, who did? And he came up with the name Jacob Younger. So he gave a description of this Jacob Younger and this mob, this very adamant mob actually might have tried to grab the wrong person in their pursuit for this suspect. But within a few days, the police believe that there really isn't any accomplice. Yeah. They realize this guy's a congenital liar, as you write, and they are just set to indict him and take him to trial. And what you write is that once he realizes the mobs that are there for him, again, very much like a psychopathic mindset, he is enjoying mm. himself. And joined the limelight. Yeah. Well, yeah, he had his photograph taken and, you know, which was then made up into these cabinet cards and sold as souvenirs. But uh, yeah, I mean, again, Probst is not unique in claiming that there was another accomplice involved who really did the dirty work. But one of the reasons authorities doubted him was they just partly couldn't believe, you know, that there would be two human beings who could commit such an incredible atrocity. Right. So he was, you know, tried, very sensational trial. There are all these, you know, bat, you, we tend to think of true crime as a kind of recent phenomenon, but true crime publications mm -hmm. really go back almost to the invention of the printing press. And back in Probe's time, you know, they would churn out these hack writers, you know, would churn out these uh, crime pamphlets. Uh, many of them, actually, I mean, I own one on probes, which is very useful to me in my writing. You know, sometimes they're complete transcripts of the trials. So probes was tried, convicted. And finally, when he was in prison and awaiting execution, you know, he decided to confess. And, you know, his confession was incredibly shocking. I mean, what he said was that he had decided to rob uh, Deering, but then... He didn't want to leave any witnesses. Basically, what he did was when Deering was off, first he killed Cornelius and shoved his corpse in a haystack. Then he went back to the house and he would call each member of the family one by one into the barn under some pretext. And as soon as they entered, he would brain them with an axe, hide the body. You know, then he'd go and, you know, tell, he'd kill them, kill the mother. I think he killed the mother first, telling her that there was some trouble with a calf or something in the barn. And then he would go and get a kid and said, hey, your mother wants to see you. Kid would go into the barn. Probes would murder the kid, shove the body under the hay. You know, he did this repeatedly. Then when Deering and his, his uh, cousin came back, Probes lured Deering into the barn and killed him. And then he killed the cousin. It was just this incredibly, incredibly horrific, methodical slaughter uh, of this family one at a time. So his account of the murders, which he delivered this completely unemotional, matter-of-fact way that apparently made it even more chilling to hear by his interrogators. When I researched and wrote the book, I came to believe that it was arguably the most monstrous mass murder of, of the American 19th century. Yes, absolutely. Let's use this as an opportunity, Harold, to stop for a second to hear from our sponsor. In honor of Valentine's Day this month, I was thinking about the kinds of things most important when trying to find the right person in your life, such as matching personalities, common sense of humor, shared values and life goals, and overall chemistry. Too bad there's not some sort of technology that can easily find the right person for you. But if you're hiring, there is technology that can quickly help you find the right person for your open role. Zip Recruiter's matching technology. And right now, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash murder. ZipRecruiter helps you to meet desirable candidates by using its smart matching technology to identify the most qualified candidates that you're looking for. When you see a potential employee for your job, ZipRecruiter makes it easy to send them a personal invite, making them more likely to apply for your job. To get their attention, ZipRecruiter also offers labels regarding flexibility, such as urgent, training provided, and remote. Find candidates you're crazy about with ZipRecruiter. Employers love ZipRecruiter. In fact, four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. See for yourself. Go to this exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash murder. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash murder. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. 
we need to talk about in December 1874, the Detroit Free Press reported on the string of strange medical cases that had recently appeared in different parts of the state. Various illnesses and afflictions, the physicians were called in to examine these patients, and they all had offered different diagnoses, including spinal fever and rheumatism of the heart. The cause, the true cause, you write, was the sickness was the wallpaper, and the pigment used to produce the color contained a large amount of arsenic. And you write about Arsenic being a common ingredient in an amazing array of articles. He was even bizarrely popular as a Victorian beauty product and gained a reputation as a cosmetic wonder drug. But it was also used to kill rats. And for a penny, you write that you could kill, buy enough poison, arsenic poison, to kill 50 people. Let's talk about Lydia Sherman, born Lydia Danbury, and her experiences with arsenic. Well, let me begin by saying that my interest in Lydia Sherman began a number of years ago, actually when I was writing a book about another notorious female poisoner named Jane Toppin. And the reason I was drawn to that case was because I had become very interested uh, in the whole question of female serial murder. Because the time I was writing this, he received wisdom was there was no such thing as a woman serial killer. Aileen Warnos, you know, supposedly was the first female serial killer. Right. Although in many ways, she didn't even really fit, to my mind, the profile of what a serial killer is. But anyway, what I came to discover is you know, that there have been many, many women serial killers. It's just that they don't commit their crimes in the same way that male serial killers do. There's kind of a gender difference. You know, in my book, I, right. you know, argue that there's a famous culture critic, you know, Pogli says there's no female Jack the Ripper, which is true, but that doesn't mean there are no female serial killers. It just means that kind of sexual mutilation murder is not the kind of serial murder that female serial killers engage in. Right. You know, that is a strictly male phenomenon. And I think it correlates, you know, since with, I think it correlates in general, male sexual behavior. Women, there have been many female serial killers. Again, back in the 19th century, you know, their preferred method was was to poison their victims. And what I argued in my book is that one could argue that these female poisoners were even more sadistic than somebody like Jack the Ripper. Uh, yes. Because yes. Jack the Ripper killed his victims very swiftly. All of the atrocities he perpetrated on their bodies were done post-mortem, you know. So, you know, he was obviously doing these appalling things, but he was doing them to corpses. He wasn't prolonging their deaths. Whereas with these female poisoners, you know, they will sometimes subject, subject their victims to days or even weeks, you know, this slow agonizing death before they put them to death. And uh, the other thing about female serial killers, which again makes them arguably even scarier than men, is that their victims tend to be very close family members. You know, they're, they're not into killing strangers the way male serial killers tend to be. Right. They murder husbands, they murder siblings, they murder children. So yeah, so Jane Toppin, so, so there were a number of these very sensational cases back in the late 19th century of what the press would call these American Borgias, referring back to you know, the legendary Renaissance poisoner, Lucretia Borgia. Mm -hmm. You know, so Lydia Sherman was typical of her breed. She was a woman who, over the course of her adult life, you know, at first she was married. She was married at first at a young age to a guy named Edward Struck, who was a, became a New York City policeman, but then was fired in disgrace and sank into, you know, this uh, very, very deep clinical depression, you know, to a point where he was just completely bedridden, really. And she decided she didn't want to take care of him anymore. So he he became her first victim. Every time Lydia seemed to face some sort of, you know, when things became too hard for her, you know, she was left with all these kids. I think there were six children, maybe. I remember, well, whatever. I mean, she ended up killing all her kids. Yes. You know, because it was just too hard for her to take care of all her kids. Absolutely. You know, one by one. You know, as long as some of the older ones were capable of working and bringing some money, you know, they they were safe. But as soon as anything happened, if one of them fell ill, you know, one of them stopped being able to pull his own fight or her 
financial weight, or if one of the little ones, you know, became ill and needed too much attention, she would start feeding them arsenic. And again, they would all suffer these agonizing deaths. I mean, one of the things that I learned from writing these books is that we're very lucky, all of us, to be alive now <laughs> in terms of medicine. Yes, yes. And because medicine was in such a primitive state then. Yeah. A, all of these toxins, you know, were, I mean, arsenic was just sold openly, you know, again, if you want to, I mean, a lot of these poisoners, as you said, these field poisoners, you know, just go to the pharmacy and, you know, say they needed a bunch of arsenic to kill their rats or something. But uh, it wasn't just that, it was that, you know, medications, you know, would con contain these poisonous substances. Strychnine was an ingredient in some medications. You read these early medical manuals, the Merck medical manuals, from back then, you know, it's like, hey, if your kid has a whipping cough, just give him a teaspoon of formaldehyde, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and also, you know, the doctors just constantly misdiagnose these things. You know, some young woman would suddenly be stricken and die, and they would diagnose it as nephritis or, you know, malaria, whatever. So these women could get away with committing these murders for a very long time, as Jane did. You know, she got then got married to another guy, an older man named Hurlbert. She ended up murdering him when he became a little incapacitated. She murdered her third husband, whose name was Sherman, and a couple of his kids. So I can't remember her, her total number. Maybe you did. Ten. Ten. Three husbands, seven children, they say. Before, you know, eventually what happens uh, in these, or when you look back at these cases, is finally somebody gets suspicious. Yeah. Some type of relative like or a friend, you know, will notice, hey, this, you know, my sister was really healthy yesterday, and suddenly today she looks like she's dying. You know, my brother in law, or whatever. So, you know, and then they did have tests uh, that would, you know, could determine the presence of arsenic in viscera. Mm -hmm. So what happened to Jane and, you know, ended up happening to a lot of these female poisoners of the time. You know, they just, uh, they can't stop doing it. You know, to some extent, there's a, often a mercenary component, you know, because they're collecting on insurance policies. But some of these women, and, and Lydia included, I mean, you know, they reach a point after a while where they really don't need the money. You know, they've just become addicted to murder and are obviously deriving, you know, some other uh, satisfaction from not only killing their closest relatives, but from watching them suffer. So that, that sadistic component. It is what they share with male serial killers. And again, I mean, there's some of the crimes they commit are worse than somebody like Jack the Ripper, you know, because again, you're sitting at the bedside, you know, of one of your children, you know, watching them undergo these agonies for days, you know, before, before you finally administer a lethal dose and put them out of their misery. Anyway, so yeah, so that was Lydia Sherman. She ended up tried arrested. She actually managed to escape at one point but was promptly rearrested and spent the rest of her life uh, incarcerated. What's fascinating is that not only does she dupe these doctors, you say that the state of medicine was primitive, but each time she conned all of these people by playing, as you write, the real attentive and concerned person, yeah. tending to her husband, tending to the children, tending to others. And But she duped one of these doctors so badly that he recommended she be hired as a nurse and she became a professional nurse for a short period of time, didn't she? Incredible. One of those ironies. Yes, she became a healthcare worker. Again, you know, like so many psychopaths, I mean, it's one of the defining characteristics of these kinds of psychopaths is, you know, that they're very, very, very skilled at feigning, you know, normal human behavior. You know, there's a famous psych psychiatrist named Cleckley, Harvey Cleckley, you know, who coined this phrase, the mask of sanity. Yes. So Jane put on this very, very convincing mask. But again, you know, that's exactly what, what enables serial murderers to get away with their crimes for so long uh, because they seem so normal that nobody can detect the malevolence, you know, that's really underneath all that. In this story as well, there is this startling confession. She says she has a religious conversion and decides to do again another detailed confession and she delivers, doesn't she? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those crime pamphlets, you, you can actually nowadays uh, find them online. 
I'm pretty sure the Lydia Sherman one is available online for any of your interested listeners. And, you know, they're very, very fascinating documents. Again, invaluable help to someone like me because they often will have pretty accurate biographies, life stories of the killers. And then they'll have very detailed transcripts of the trials. And in many cases, you know, the, the, the perpetrator's confessions, plus some of them are illustrated in interesting ways. But again, yeah, these, those were the instant true crime books of the time, you know, equivalent to the kinds of paperback true crime books that at least going back to the beginning of paperback book publishing, I guess, in the forties and fifties you know, have always been rushed out on the heels of sensational crime. Let's use this as an opportunity to stop for a second for these messages. Now, let's talk about part three and what you call Lady Killer. And this is the summer of 1895. The nation is shocked by reports of, of a horrific discovery in Chicago. And of course, we're talking about H.H. H. Holmes and the Castle of Horrors. But in that time, when they arrested Holmes, he tried to cast the blame on some of his most heinous crimes on an accomplice named Edward Hatch, saying he was the henchman. And there was a concerted effort, you write, to locate the man. He was also known as Johann Hock, and they termed him the new H.H. Holmes. So tell us a little bit about Johann Hock and his behavior. A Hock was a type of serial murderer known as a blue beard, named after the famous uh, fairy tale by the French writer Charles Perrault, appeared in Perrault's collection of what he called Mother Goose stories. Blue mm. in the fairy tale was this aristocrat with a blue beard who, because of his wealth, manages to marry a string of young women. And in the story, he brings him to his castle, and he says he has to go on a trip. He leaves him with a key ring, says they could go to anywhere in the castle they want to, except for this one forbidden room. And naturally, you know, the women go into the room, and what they discover there are the dismembered corpses of all his previous wives. And then when he returns and discovers they disobeyed him, you know, they meet the same fate. So the term Bluebeard has come to be applied. Well, Bluebeard is you know, is the male equivalent of a killer like Lydia Sherman. Right. Bluebeard killers. The Bluebeard serial murder refers to a, a man who murders a succession of wives, marries a succession of wives, and murders them, often for mercenary gain. Uh, there have been a number of very, very sensational Bluebeard killers. There was one in France named Henri Landru. You know, there have been others in America. Ock was an especially prolific specimen who would, uh, he was a German immigrant, went by various aliases, and he spent his career really going around the country. He, he was not a particularly good-looking man, but he talked a good line. He would prey on primarily these uh, German widows who he would determine before marrying them had a certain amount of money in the bank, and he would wed them. And within you know, very short time. The wedding managed to get hold of their money by various means. You know, many of them, he just, he would just rob and disappear. But in a number of cases, and it's not exactly known how many, uh, he would, he would actually murder the women again by administering poison to them. And, you know, when they fell ill, he would, again, a lot like Lydia Sherman, you know, minister to them lovingly and make sure they always took their medicine, which he, also made sure nobody else ever gave them but him because it was always spiked with poison. And again, he committed these crimes all over the country under all kinds of different names. So he got away with it for a long time until he was finally tracked down. There was a reverend in, I guess it was West Virginia, who became very suspicious of him after one of his parishioners who had just gotten married to Hawk and had been this healthy woman, excuse me, suddenly fell ill, fell ill and died. And it was largely through his efforts, unrelenting efforts, that Hawk was finally identified and caught and tried for his crimes. You know, and he also very much enjoyed the limelight that he achieved. But yeah, he's one of the most infamous Bluebeard killers in our history. By the way, what you began by talking about, uh, where Holmes blamed this accomplice named Hatch, Again, very much the way probes blame this imaginary accomplice. Right. But there were some theories that Hawk was Hatch because Hawk was in Chicago at the time 
that Holmes was operating there. And of course, Holmes himself was something of a bluebeard killer. But but there's no evidence. I mean, well, you know, Hatch didn't even exist. He was just a imaginary scapegoat for home. You do write that there was someone that said that he had spoke about spending an evening or some time at this hotel of H.H. H. Holmes. Yeah, but again, I mean, there's so much, I mean, so much was written about Holmes at the time, you know, this complete fabrication. Mm-hmm. It's, again, talk about shamelessness, you know, people like Hearst, people like Pulitzer, the great masters of yellow journalism back then. Yeah. You really have to take almost everything that appears in their papers with a large grain of salt. You do write, though, though, that uh, Hotch attracted 3,000 people, mostly women, young women. And this, you write, this morbid, hungry mob was awaiting his arrival at both police stations. So they, these people wanted to get a glimpse of this, what they considered a celebrity. And you continue and write a very much paralleling what we think is modern behavior on behalf of true crime fans, women interested in murderers as celebrities, that he received all of these valentines. Yeah. And, and, uh, handkerchief waving women in Belleville, Ohio, when he was on the train. So very much highly anticipated. He became a celebrity at that time. Well, that's very typical, you know, of these serial killers. In fact, almost every case I've written about where there's been a male serial killer, whatever a trial, most of the spectators who turn out are women. And you know, I'm sure you're aware of the whole phenomenon of serial killer groupies and so on. You know, no matter how horrific and repulsive. You know, you have some of these serial killers who could never get a date. And then as soon as they are revealed as serial murderers, they get all these marriage proposals. Yes, it's incredible. They sometimes do get married. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there's nothing unusual about that. We will leave it up to the psychiatrist to decide what that's all about. But I have my own theories. But anyway, uh, so yeah, that's very, very typical. Absolutely. I want to thank you very much, Harold Schechter, for coming on and talking about your latest Butcher's work, True Crime Tales of American Murder and Madness. Thank you so much for this interview. And for people that want to take a look, they could go to Amazon and see all the rest of your work, which is numerous books. I don't even know how many by now. But again, they could go to Amazon and see your latest Butcher's work, True Crime Tales of American Murder and Madness. Thank you so much for this interview. Harold Schechter, you have a great evening. Thank you, Dan. And good night. Thank you, Dan. You too. Thank you.